everyone. Welcome to the first Berkman luncheon uh, in the new academic year. It's my great pleasure to welcoming you all. My name is Urs Gasser. I serve as the executive director of the Berkman Center. Um, this is a very special event today. Uh, it's part of a Berkman Orientation Week, uh, one could say. Uh, we've pulled up on the screen the different um, events that we pulled together this year to give you an opportunity um, to better understand what Berkman is doing. Um, to keep it very brief, I think it's the most amazing place uh, in the world, so I encourage you uh, really to attend our events and learn more about it. Yeah, applause, please, come on. It's like a rock concert. No, uh, it's really a fantastic place and uh, I'm delighted to see so many um, familiar and new faces in the room. Um, uh, we're very much looking forward to the presentation um, by our uh, faculty chair, Prof Professor Jonathan Citrain, who will um, give us an introduction to the Berkman Center as a co-founder and now faculty chair, uh, but also, I think, highlight some of the projects and hopefully this will be a very interactive uh, session. So with that, uh, thank you, Jonathan, over to you. Thank you, Urs, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for um, spending some of your hunger with us. I hope we've been able to um, alleviate it in some way. And I realize that for some of you, you may have classes at 1, so we will not be offended should you walk out in time for your 1 o'clock class, although I also realize it might be overdetermined. You could be both upset and bored and have a 1 o'clock class, and we would never know it, but that's OK. Uh, so I wanted today to talk a little bit about uh, the Berkman Center. It's not an easy thing to do. In past years, when we've done orientations like these, we've tried to put it all on one evening, and uh, the range of activities of the Berkman Center and the people involved, uh, many of you here are already involved, is so broad, so kaleidoscopic, that it um, becomes reminiscent of one person's description of history uh, as one damn thing after another. And in some ways, that's what the Berkman Center is. So we're doing our best to kind of blunt the relentless quality of describing to you uh, as a way of inviting you to participate everything that we're doing. Uh, and instead thought we would have kind of an orientation season, or at least week. And you can see here a number of activities for which, if you missed the Internet Policy Symposium at the Kennedy School, that's okay. It's going to be on C-SPAN. And so if half of you watch it, we will break records on C-SPAN of uh, <laughs> not since the Agriculture Committee hearing of 2002 will there be so many people watching. And then um, here we are at the Open Tuesday Luncheon. What makes a lunch a luncheon? I don't know, but Wikipedia probably does. <laughs> Charlie Nesson's, pro but then this luncheon has just become a lunch because Charlie Nesson is not here. But the food tastes just as good, which is not to say that it tastes good, it just tastes just as good. So anyway, um, uh, what we're doing is we're going to have the introductory part today uh, where we'll talk a little bit, and then tomorrow is sort of the science fair-like research showcase, though I cannot promise a um, baking soda lava display. Uh, but there will be a showcase uh, here on campus um, in a mystery location. It's up to you to find out where it is. Milstein. From, what's that? Milstein. Milstein, I'm told. And um, Milstein, aren't we in Milstein? Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> similar time, somewhat different time, similar place uh, for the research showcase where each of the projects will have a chance to tell you more individually what they're about. You can kind of be like a skeptical consumer going up to each one and like, why should I give my brain cycles to you? And then by the end of the evening, realize, while you may be a consumer of information, maybe you shouldn't be a skeptical consumer. This is a chance to join one of many projects uh, and that showcase will be a great chance to learn more about them in a more systematic way. Uh, we have the Dipsy Digital Problem Solving Initiative kickoff uh, at the formerly known as Hugsy, the Harvard Graduate School of Education, um, on the 11th. I don't know, Urs, if you want to just say something quickly about that. Do you still have the mic? Uh, yeah, I can say more about it. So that's a, a kickoff event for a university-wide initiative where we bring together students with mentors to work 
on concrete opportunities and occasionally problems that we can solve here in our uh, Harvard community. So uh, students in particular, please join us to learn more about it and, and check out the website. will there be food? There will be uh, food, yes. for sure, yes. Free pizza. <laughs> there will so, now, yeah, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> and eventually students then, yeah. Excellent. And then you can see, wrapping around to next week, uh, there is the special Electronic Frontier Foundation Berkman Cyber Law Pub Trivia Night. Uh, Kurt Upsall of EFF, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sorry to catch you mid-sandwich. Um, that is a huge piece of lettuce. Uh, yeah, so uh, come, come next Monday to the Cyber Law Pub Quiz. We will ask uh, questions, uh, trivial questions about... Uh, law and technology policy, and uh, then join together in teams and su see who knows the most trivial things. Is there a prize? Honor. You get the amazing <laughs> honor of winning. Oh, that's too bad. I thought there was going to be a prize. Uh, and uh, then finally, we'll hear from the Berkman Geeks with their technical project uh, showcase. Sebastian, where are you? Where's our chief geek wearing a lovely Nantucket pink? Uh, <laughs> That's just for those watching the webcast in black and white who wanted them to know. For which I should also remind you, this is all being recorded and put on our permanent records, so be aware. Yes? So we're running a technical showcase where we're going to demonstrate what technologies we use to get the technical work done at the Berkman Center. Uh, those include many projects that you've heard of, maybe Media Cloud or H2O or... Uh, chilling effects or tag team, some of these tools that you've used and some that maybe you haven't. And we're going to be showcasing the, the technology that we use. So if you heard of some of the languages like Ruby or PHP or Node.js or some Lisp. Of <laughs> if you've heard of Lisp. Just parenthetically, I want to put that in. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> anyway. You have to drop the mic. Yeah. All right. Moving right along. Uh, so we have all of these uh, events to help ease us in, and you can uh, pick and choose whatever you like. Basically, the idea is uh, sometimes I feel like if I used to read Wired magazine, I guess everyone used to read Wired magazine. <laughs> Ouch. Um, or you know, some of those magazines like The Economist, which is like one damn thing after another, and you start to just feel this learned helplessness of there's too much going on in the world and. I, you know, nobody's noticing me or what can I do, that kind of thing. We don't want that to be the case. So each of these instances is meant to be participatory, to have a chance to draw you in. And if there's any point of connection with almost anything going on over the course of the next week or so, we hope that you'll have a chance to find it. So let me give you just a little bit of background about uh, the Berkman Center. And as I'm doing it, I've asked Shailen Thomas here uh, my intrepid research associate saved from being a 1L this very month by signing up for full-time research work. And you don't regret it, do you, Shayla? Not yet. Yes. Oh, very good. <laughs> Let's see how long the lunch lasts. So um, uh, I've asked Shailen to be able to Google some of the stuff that I'm talking about so you don't have to. Um, uh, so think back to 1997. Those were good times. The West Wing was enjoying one of its early seasons uh, on television. People remember television. <laughs> Programs would come on. You'd watch them, that kind of thing. And uh, it looked like maybe there might be something to this internet thing. At a time when we had been mostly exposed to CompuServe, AOL, Prodigy, the source, MCI Mail, things like that, all these pay services. And this internet was sort of coming into prominence. And there were folks who studied, um, oh yeah, that's, <laughs> CompuServe still exists as the walking dead. Uh, they're, they're, yes, they use Lisp. They're showing all the banner ads so other sites don't have to. But um, anywho, um, uh, in 1997, the state of kind of cyber law, such as it was, was it was not um, in high gear. There were lots of ways of asking questions that would say, here's a new computer-like phenomenon, now what? Or is there a law against this? And we sit around, is there a law against this? There might be, that is all. And um, that would prepare young lawyers for writing memos of exactly that sort and then sending exorbitant bills afterwards. Um, 
And then uh, a guy named Larry Lessig came along and uh, long before there was tweet length sensitivity, came up with something even shorter than a tweet, a bumper sticker really, in which he declared code is law in this famous article responding to Judge Easterbrook who had said uh, that cyber law doesn't really exist. It's like the law of the horse and we have no horse law. He had to remind everybody, you can't take a class in that. Instead, contracts will tell you about selling horses, and Tord will tell you about stealing them or hurting them, and Krim will, Krim will tell you about stealing them, won't they? Well, you'll find out if you're a 1L. Anyway, there's no law of the horse. Why should there be a law of the computer? So Frank Easterbrook wrote this article in 1996. Larry Lessig wrote a response trying to take up this challenge directly. I'll have you know, Frank Easterbrook is coming back to this campus to deliver the Scalia lecture in November. And I have asked if he would be willing to do a retrospective conversation with Larry Lessig entitled, Larry Was Right. And I <laughs> haven't heard from him yet, but I'm willing to tweak the details uh, if he is, and we'll see if we can make that happen. But Larry's basic point, distilled into a book uh, that's now gone through uh, two versions and is available free and open online, um, I think codev2.cc, was that what makes this space so special is less the law part, it's because code is law too. And the constraints that we encounter in the world often determine our behavior, both limiting it and incenting us to other behaviors just as much or maybe even more strongly than a law does, but more subtly, and we don't notice it as much, so we don't tend to protest against it the way we would against a law that we don't like. And he says that makes it very powerful, a very special dynamic across many areas, and that's why we should be studying the code as much as we might be studying the law and the institutions producing the code, because often this code ends up as a platform. It's something that everybody might be, or many people, sharing together at once. It's not just a little code here and code there. So uh, figuring out who was making the code and how they might be influenced or what their goals might be uh, really did turn kind of cyber law as a field around and made it broader than just any study of old law. And that's one reason why over the years the Berkman Center founded around 97, 98 at a time when it was recommended to be called the Center on Law and Technology just to hedge our bets. We ended up saying, nope, internet and society. So far that's proved pretty good. And now it's a university-wide center precisely because the methodologies we would use, the things we study go so far beyond just what's studied in the halls of this business school-like looking part <laughs> of the law school. We do have a little B school uh, NB, which is now satisfied, I believe, by the Milstein complex. So um, uh, asking the question of what if no one owned the code? The code still might influence us, but what if no one owned it? Is that even possible to have unowned code? And the answer turns out to be yes. Uh, Richard Stallman over at MIT uh, really was a pioneer of what he would later insist be called the free software movement. Free is in speech, not as in beer. And the idea that you could release code into the wild, others could modify it, fork it, come up with new versions, and before you know it, it's everywhere. And uh, as some might uh, remember from last spring, uh, a module uh, of code called OpenSSL passed around from one website to another and one web server to another like a Christmas fruitcake. If you want the website to communicate securely, why not pull OpenSSL off the shelf, it is free as in beer and as in speech. And it turns out that like the graduate student in Germany who maintained it um, had a mistake in it, a mistake that meant it was hackable. And in fact, not only hackable, but you could find out random pieces of stuff on any server running it. And if you were um, assiduous enough, you could basically slurp nearly everything in the server's memory. Um, Bruce Schneier is sort of giving the, eh, you're not really getting this precise pedantic move, but um, <laughs> I respect that in Bruce Schneier, although am I right, Bruce, that on a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of internet security breach, you called Heartbeat an 11? I did. Do you regret it? No, at, at the time the uncertainty was so high it was the right thing to do, and, and there was a complicated fix. How would you rate it now? Mm, it's four, six. Okay, so it's kind of the Ebola of, uh, it's like we get really worried, it's very lurid, but it turns out 
there may, it may be of a piece with other major cybersecurity problems. Let me just double check with Andy Ellis, the Chief Security Officer of Akamai. Andy, on a scale of one to 10, where's Heartbleed? Probably more of an eight or a nine. All right, so panel discussion right after the Easterbrook-Lessig <laughs> debate. But for different reasons. For different reasons. It turns out it's semantics and we all actually agree. Very good, so now I've, <laughs> we don't have to have the debate after all. So um, anyway, just think about that fact though. Like, we don't find it weird that some German graduate student makes a mistake and, like, the Bank of America is brought to its knees and everybody's panicking for a matter of weeks about an insecure internet, all right? If that doesn't feel weird to you, I say you haven't thought about it enough. <laughs> it's very, very weird. And that open source and free software also is recognized in this weird collective hallucination network that we call the internet, that is a set of protocols by which anybody wanting to join the internet can communicate, and uh, anybody can build an app on top of it, which is why, famously, the internet has no main menu, no CEO, no director of customer service, no abuse desk, no board of directors, and no capitalization. Right? That also strikes me as weird. It just has kind of stewards, Loraxes, who speak for the trees, some of whom I think are in this room. Lynn St. Amour, are you here? Is Lynn here? Oh, Lynn St. Amour, former president of the Internet Society, ISOC. Uh, am I getting right the description of the Internet? This is your chance to tell me I'm not sort of just nodding affirmatively in a way that says, please don't ask me a follow-up question. <laughs> but. So Lynn is a great example of somebody in the Boston area, I hope soon to be affiliated formally with Berkman, um, uh, who has uh, run an organization for a decade that has not controlled the internet, not even built the internet, but just tried to be sort of the watering hole, the umbrella under which a lot of salutary activities can take place um, that results in the building of the internet, and ditto for the web. Right? A guy named Tim, who happens to work down the street at MIT at the time, taking time off from like thinking about particle physics, was like, there ought to be a web. And like, here's a server, here's a client. All right, world, start building web pages and start browsing them. And it started working. And you end up with a web. And you can put anything on the web because it's just a protocol. And you don't have to. I'm sure Tim would be open to your putting up your website. But you don't have to consult with him in order to have the hamster dance or cats that look like Hitler, uh, <laughs> other sites. Um, either the Kittlers, no? It's too All soon. Right. Too, we'll soon. too soon. <laughs> um, but uh, it's just one of those things where you can pretty much do whatever you want. And um, <laughs> Yeah, just get the top, the best Kittlers, not the latest. There's a few that are... <laughs> Look at that one, oh my god. All right, well now that we've offended nearly everybody, moving right along, um, uh, this is the kind of phenomenon we're trying to study, and it is truly the gift that keeps on giving, and it is the gift that keeps inviting us to build upon it not just to study it, but to be part of the contact sport that is building and existing online, whether you're writing code, whether you are writing content, things like Wikipedia. It's no surprise it didn't come out of academia. Can you imagine the committee meetings about, well, wait a minute, there's going to be a compendium of all knowledge. We need to consult Borges first. And uh, instead, a guy named Jimbo running a search engine that made some money is like, you know what? Let's do Wikipedia. And he starts off with Newpedia, which is a model of commissioning people to uh, write articles like experts. Um, and he ended up with like seven articles and nah, <laughs> tenure, what are you going to do? And then um, uh, the back room was a wiki where people could make edits to them. And the wiki soon took over the whole project. And you ended up with Wikipedia. And uh, there was a time when it looked like it was only good for canonical descriptions of Star Trek episodes, and then it moved beyond that. <laughs> and looking at phenomena like that shows that the kind of contribution the internet invites is not just nerdly, it is at the content layer and the artistic layer and the rhetorical layer as well. So if I had to try to give a kind of framework for um, the sorts of things the Berkman Center studies, Here's what I want to tell you about. I want to tell you about three rough areas that describe uh, more or less what we do. 
and then a number of stances or approaches that we take to studying it that tries descriptively to capture the great variety of things you're going to hear about uh, should you go tomorrow to the showcase. And the first area, I would say, is platforms. Platforms being those commonalities in a technological environment that can greatly empower people who want to contribute to it and greatly shape the uses of that environment. And our studies of platforms range from the owned platforms. We were uh, one of the first to really dig into the Microsoft case as it unfolded uh, at the end of the 1990s. Larry was dubbed special master in the case for a while until the DC Circuit had some reason to rule that cases should be heard by Article III lifetime tenure holding judges rather than some random guy the judge appointed as a special master. I don't know why. Um, and uh, uh, that includes the provision of internet access. Susan Crawford, are you here today? Susan. So uh, how worried should we be about uh, the way in which we get our broadband? Is it sort of like, look, there's Wi-Fi, there's LTE, or whatever the kids are cooking up these days uh, in the relevant engineering groups, and yeah, there's Comcast, uh, or is it something that the future might not resemble this wonderfully bountiful present? No choice, and I, yeah, your mic might, might not be on. Uh, Susan Crawford, one of our faculty directors uh, in residence uh, all year and teaching a number of classes yeah, here. I was being stentorian and no one could hear me. <laughs> What's the point? You were very John Kerry like. In I was that really sort trying of, to project yeah. here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but what you were saying is two thirds of Americans will have no, no choice, choice, which some people understand as one choice. That always confused me. When is it one right. choice? Right, no choice other than. Other than they have their. For, for broadband, and that is a right. problem, is what you're saying. I thought, you know, yeah. And you're working on it. <laughs> well, I think the whole country's working on it, and a lot of mayors are working on it right And now. you're also working on municipal platforms. Uh, right, exactly. Fiber access in America needs to take off in cities, and that's where the Berkman Center is quite active in coordinating uh, mayors across uh, Massachusetts and ultimately across the country. Yes. Massachusetts should lead the country in fiber as it did in healthcare. So with the so-called internet hourglass that you might learn about in Susan's class or in my class, which uh, this year is being held at Stanford, and the Harvard students will be flown to Stanford by Stanford for the three weeks of January term. Um, so that should be fun. Uh, you'll hear about the internet hourglass. That's an example of platforms at the lower level, like the uh, hardware and protocol layer. But it's uh, true all the way up the so-called Stack. So like Michael Papish, I see, is here. Michael, you've uh, been at this for a long time. You did a startup called Media Unbound many years ago. How did that work out? Uh, it took about a 10-year-long startup to do music recommendations. And uh, the finding was you should stay away from the music industry. It's uh, not a fun place to work. <laughs> Another satisfied customer. <laughs> but you got bought, right? We got bought by Rovi. And that's where we learned that the saving grace of having patented the entire EPG uh, television grid is that no one conceives of television in a grid anymore. So luckily, those patents will hopefully not be uh, so important. So Rovi is like a patent troll masquerading as a company? Sure. Let's, yes, that's probably about correct. OK. Yes. <laughs> we'll see you at the deposition. That'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> Hope your stock has vested. Um, so uh, those interested in startups, to the extent that you could be thinking about the larger ecosystem at the time you're doing this thing that you're confident will change the world seems great. And that's one way in which our relationship with the iLab over at the B School or near the B School uh, is so fruitful that we tend to be thinking about the larger ecosystem and the ways in which all those great ideas being cooked up over there uh, and elsewhere uh, may fit in. So platforms is one zone that we're really interested in. Um, I would put uh, uh, privacy as another current area that captures a lot of what the Berkman Center is doing, whether that is uh, privacy foregrounded against governments these days because of Snowden's uh, leaks and such, um, or whether it's corporate privacy with uh, firms like Axiom. I don't know, Sarah Marie Watson, you want to just tell us something quickly about Axiom that will uh, inform and puzzle us? Uh, well, there's a lot of data that's coming uh, offline. So there's this whole thing called onboarding, which is matching up all of our, um, uh, those 
of CVS cards and all these uh, response to me. Finally, my things. loyalty to my loyalty card will be rewarded by matching it up with all your other digital information. So, so that what can happen? We can do all kinds of things like uh, target people for predatory loans. <laughs> for making them or obtaining them? I see. All right. So um, that can be referred directly to our um, predatory loan clinic and another kind of nice link between the Berkman Center and the rest of the law school. Um, so corporate privacy, another uh, issue. And you might put in that category something like the right to be forgotten, recently recognized by the European Court of Justice, trying to sort that out. As best I can tell, Google was like OMFG when that came down. And they're starting to process that and figure out how to implement it. Uh, we have many uh, scholars, fellows uh, here thinking that through, uh, trying to figure out is it good, is it bad, the right to be forgotten, threat or menace. And, um, uh, but they're really on all sides of that debate and also just wanting to get the data in. What kind of requests are being made? Um, what kind of requests are being granted? How could you document that without it being a stick in the eye of the right to be forgotten. Here are the things that have recently been forgotten. Don't. So um, we're thinking about that. And uh, people like Wendy Seltzer and Adam Holland of our Chilling Effects Project uh, and others are working on uh, that kind of stuff. And finally, it might be worth thinking about peer-to-peer -peer privacy, which is to say, as things like Google Glass and civilian drones uh, get more and more common, it's much harder to think about defending your privacy against your neighbor who will see the right to record and to send a drone somewhere as like a First Amendment right. And we have folks thinking about that. Jesse Rossman, are you here today? Jesse, did you not make it over? Uh, I guess not. Uh, two folks from the uh, ACLU of Massachusetts are wanting to teach a study group this year at the Berkman Center, which you have a chance to uh, enroll in, on when the First Amendment meets the Fourth Amendment. Uh, or when the First Amendment meets privacy expectations, and how we can think about balancing with Google Glass and drones and such, those sorts of uh, things. The titanium collection. <laughs> you need your thing to be titanium, so when the fist hits it, 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 it you don't have to send it back under warranty. So um, very good stuff. So that's sort of uh, privacy. And uh, Salil, are you here? Salil Radan, you and RSVB, there you are. Um, and you're doing a great project on privacy tools for research. Uh, so Professor Vada, why don't you tell us just quickly about that over from uh, the CS perspective? I don't think so. Can the computer science professor turn on the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> Awkward. It's analog. Yeah. It's analog, yeah, yeah. It is zero and one, that's true. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the big problem is that anonymization doesn't work. And you strip the data set of uh, identifiers and often people still can be identified and uh, that's a big problem for researchers who want to share data with e each other for replication. But companies have never gotten in trouble for sharing research data or experimenting on their users, right? <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll defer that question to uh, the legal side of the project, but uh, the point is that there, are, there, are, there is hope for, for better solutions uh, coming from a mixture of computer science and law and other approaches. It's a fascinating project. I should also add that Salil uh, runs our center, uh, our circus, our center for research on computation and society uh, over at SEAS. So a number of folks thinking about these things. Yeah, that's right. There's a, a, a relative center of the, of the Berkman uh, Center uh, based over in the, uh, in the School of Engineering. Um, just a uh, 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 hop and a skip away, very close uh, by here. And uh, we wel welcome the entire Berkman community at all of our activities. In particular, our, uh, our lunch seminar series. You can see some of the upcoming talks there on the right right-hand bar. And there's Bruce Schneier <laughs> on the screen and in person uh, here. Very good. Uh, thank you, uh, Salil. And I should say, too, I think in approximately one minute, this is really like a disastrous thing for me to say in the context of this presentation, but I think in one minute Apple is about to unveil its new like health watch. It's like you've seen companies like Basis and Jawbone Up do it, but now watch us do it. And um, uh, it'll be very interesting to see what sort of privacy rules they have about that kind of data. 
And I think about it not just in terms of your personal privacy, what happens to all that telemetry that your iWatch is soon going to be health kit, it's called, not iWatch. Health is the framework for storing the data. So, health kit, not to be confused with Heath kit, which was when you could build your own clock, but health kit, how is that framework going to protect privacy and how do we think about it collectively when you can start asking such interesting questions once everybody buys or steals one, like, um, uh, is the city of Cleveland upset tonight? You know, generally speaking. Um, <laughs> are they awake? Because there was no are they awake? So Jawbone, the up folks, uh, did a neat little uh, thing from the Jawbone up uh, uh, personal data gathering, quantified selfie things. Uh, yep, there they are. They're so fashionable. Um, earthquake. Jawbone earthquake. Um, I love how we're just nominating searches to do. <laughs> that should be our pub trivia, to have who has the best Google foo. Um, so yeah, that's it, that's it. Click, 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 click. Very exciting. I'm working on it. <laughs> Sorry, I just, uh, I get carried away. Damn you non-neutral internet. Where is this link when you need it? But, yeah, yeah. All right, well, oh, there we go. Corpus image of sleep deprivation, followed by this wonderful chart, which actually shows you where the epicenter of the earthquake was for breakage purposes, because in Napa, look how many more people were jolted awake at 3 a.m. than, say, in Modesto and Santa Cruz. So this is the kind of data that if you're looking to figure out where to deploy your next riot police, this could also be of interest for which the health kit framework may not have anticipated those kinds of requests. And thinking about how that data should be treated, what should be thought of as in private custody or public, all of that falls within sort of things that many of the people here are interested in. The third kind of substantive area, I think, uh, to identify is, surprisingly, public discourse. There are so many ways in which, just in a short period of time, really you might peg it from 2004, 2006 or so, the rise of Facebook and Twitter in the United States, uh, the public discourse has been changed. How the agenda is set on what to think about. If you think about where you go to figure out what you should be worried about, really isn't that what news is? What should I be worried about today? Um, fewer and fewer people getting it from television and traditional media, and even that media getting its agenda set from what's trending on Twitter and Facebook. And it makes you wonder, for example, if Facebook should decide in the interests of public safety that there's enough rioting going on in Ferguson and these posts about it are just getting people angrier and angrier and possibly more violent, so let us dial down any posts about Ferguson. Do we have a problem with that? Is that yes? And how about if they say, damn the ice bucket challenge, there's just too many of those in the name of consumer sanity and making a better product with more relevant results, we're gonna dial down ice buckets. Do we have a problem with that? No, not no. Please, <laughs> when can we start? So sorting out the difference of decisions that the companies might be making, that in one place we cheer on and the other we don't, that maybe get to motive or these sort of intangible things, really tricky questions that relate back to the platforms thing because often we are getting our news or information from one of a handful of uh, sources, many of which now are being assiduously astroturfed rather than grassroots by organizations that realize the power of authenticity. And if you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> and that's what they're uh, working on. I think public discourse is also an opportunity to think about the role of academia in this world. Academia had a role in building the internet. Much of its protocols came from researchers who did not seek to patent what they came up with and saw it as contributing to a common wheel. Academia is in a tricky place today. Um, there are many outside of it who adopt its forms and functions, chalkboards covered in chalk, for example, um, that may not subscribe to the ideals of neutrality, such as it is in our post-postmodern world, or uh, a recourse to facts and to rigorous argument and to find, oh, look at that. <laughs> you should get the blackboard, though, to really get it going. Um, <laughs> Autocomplete, another issue that uh, maybe you can look at. Yeah, so, um, right. I love uh, Professor Beck there uh, doing his thing. And 
again, ideologically speaking, there is no shortage of this form of truthiness across the spectrum. And thinking about it both outside of academia and thinking about the role of academia and does it stand apart from simply being yet another dog in the fight are some of the things I think uh, that we look to ask here. And we have a number of projects, our uh, Harvard Open Access Project, which Peter Suber, I don't know if you're here, uh, you're thinking about how to get uh, information freely available among scholars out to the public in ways that don't lock it up so that it can't be part of the debate. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add about uh, open access at Harvard and, and what you're working on. That's true. Harvard has open access policies providing free online access to new scholarly articles written and published by Harvard faculty. And interestingly, those policies take the form of mandates, of requirements that faculty must lodge their papers in the uh, depositories and open archives, unless, of course, they protest and say they don't really want to, in which case they can get a waiver. They can get a waiver, but the waiver only applies to the grant of rights to Harvard. We still require a deposit in the repository. So that in the coming bad years, we can have the seed bank in Norway and the paper bank so we can reconstruct society on the basis Sometimes of Sometimes we get permission to distribute apart from the policy, and then we yes. make it open in any case. Got it. Uh, usually, 95% uh, of Harvard faculty don't choose the waiver, so we get rights instantly as soon as we get the article. Yes. We have other projects you'll find out about uh, tomorrow, like Media Cloud, tracing how memes make their way through society, and uh, a lot of people thinking about civic life, civic discourse. Kate Contreras, I don't know if you're here, one of our new fellows, looking at uh, how to get people more civically oriented in life, uh, uh, that kind of thing. And our Youth and Media Project, um, which is working really hard to think about uh, when folks are young. This is something the record industry thought it could try to do in the early 2000s to change the course of copyright history, where uh, they had a report come out. I don't know if you can, uh, oh yeah, there's the Youth Media Project. Um, the Copyright Office in the UK came out with a report about how to make people respect copyright more. And the idea was get them to respect it when they're younger by urging them to place the copyright symbol on their schoolwork as they turn it in <laughs> to really take ownership and say that uh, a B plus should be an unauthorized derivative work. You can only make this an A. So uh, all sorts of ways in which we're thinking about public discourse, open access, libraries such as our Metalab, uh, all sorts of things that uh, uh, you should uh, keep an eye out for. Okay, so those are sort of the three main areas. Let me just talk briefly about the stances with uh, which we tend to approach this generally. I've already adverted to building and not just writing. A lot of the Berkman Center projects build stuff online and sees what happens, which sometimes results in interesting telephone calls with the Office of the General Counsel, but they usually end happily. and. Um, uh, often results in spin-offs. We'll start something off here and then let it find its way in the world. Creative Commons began at the Berkman Center. In fact, began as sort of a consolation prize after we lost the uh, Eldred case, Eldred versus Reno at first and then Eldred versus Ashcroft, challenging a retroactive extension of copyright for another 20 years. And uh, uh, it's been about 20 years, so we're gonna be interested to see if they come back for another retroactive extension. Uh, but in the meantime, Creative Commons is one of the things that came out of that now thriving. You've probably used it or benefited from it. Um, Global Voices, another project that began at the Berkman Center about getting uh, voices you might not normally hear able to uh, set up on a blogging platform when blogging platforms were still pretty new. And um, as you can see, it's totally 2014 now with the intrusive pop-ups. And would you like to make the world a better place? Yes or not now? Um, <laughs> and uh, Stop Badware, another organization that works on dealing with malware and uh, dealing with uh, lists of sites that might be inadvertently dealing out malware that then Google warns you from clicking on, which then destroys the businesses of the sites in question, which then turn out to be in denial about whether they're dealing out malware, and they talk to Stop Badware about it, and usually that ends happily. Um, and the Digital Public Library of America, another uh, sort of great organization started at Berkman. So a lot of those things that sort of gestate here and uh, then find their own way. That's one stance. Another stance is that we uh, tend to have an instinct that often distributed and cooperative solutions are overlooked amidst a panoply of solutions for a given problem. Centralized ones are quite often called for and they're just often in plain view. Uh, uh, Professor Benkler and others have had a cooperation group and work on those sorts of things 
in a really interesting way. Another stance we have is that we tend to swing for the fences. We go for the A or the C, but not the B plus. Just showing up, just publishing that report or that paper, which somebody reads and says, you know, I cannot disagree with anything in this. We don't take that as four stars. That sort of would not come again, even if I'm forced to read it. And we tend to want to elicit from ourselves a level of work and of insight and of effort that uh, people may disagree with where individuals uh, come from here because we're often a little bit out there and we embrace that identity uh, rather than running from it. We couple that with wanting to be an honest broker. There's just not an ideological litmus test for participation in the uh, center. We wanna see where the data takes us and we tend to be really excited when we are proven wrong. That's a great moment to be able to meet our new selves rather than to just hang on tight uh, for something. Um, and finally, I think the animating spirit uh, is exemplified by my predecessor, Terry Fisher, over the many years, a dozen that he uh, was the chair of the Berkman Center, uh, was that all of this is because we wanna see a better world come about. We're gonna have different versions of what better means, but we're actually out to have an impact and make a difference uh, and in particular, in Terry's case, for disadvantaged populations, for people that might otherwise uh, themselves be overlooked. And that's still very much our spirit. So how is this all done? We have uh, regular courses that you can take. I've already mentioned um, the one I'm teaching in the winter at Stanford. Uh, Susan, what are you teaching this year? I'm teaching the law of surveillance. The law of surveillance, topical, topical. <laughs> Uh, Chris, uh, who runs our clinical program, I'd love for you just to say a word or two about the clinical program, another mode of getting involved. Uh, sure. We're yeah. uh, a, uh, essentially a, a small pro bono legal services organization based at the Berkman Center. We have Harvard Law School students who enroll every semester. We're up to almost 60 a year now who kind of come through the program. We do legal work for clients. The students get the sort of firsthand uh, real world practice experience and the clients get the free legal services and it's a, a win-win situation. And we couple that with a seminar that we teach, which has the students sort of doing case rounds and kind of discussing the, 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 uh, the work that they're doing along the way. Got it. And there are also lots of opportunities for independent research or study or other ways to connect with our faculty, uh, only a few of whom happen to be here right now, again, possibly because of our awkward scheduling, um, for which I only blame myself. Um, and uh, there are also just innumerable projects. And that's, again, what you'll see in the showcase, the ones that we didn't happen to mention here today. Um, some of them are going fast enough trying to change the uh, engines on the airplane while it's flying in a way that they may not have a structured onboarding or on-ramp for participation. And I just want to urge you, if it's something that seems interesting to you, go to that extra layer of persistence, send that extra email to talk to the person or people running the project and see if you can get involved. And a, a number of the things we have happening, you can just turn up um, our fellows themselves are working on um, amazing things and often will welcome uh, assistance. So that's sort of a general uh, overview of what the Berkman Center is about. I thought it would be good now just to open the floor and see if there are questions and also if there's anybody uh, at the center who wants to say something about something that he or she is working on um, uh, in the spirit of what we've already been talking about. So. Uh, who wants to be the bold soul to ask the first question? Yes, there's a mic from Kerry. Will Foster, former government relations for the Commercial Internet Exchange. Um, what are you guys doing um, in terms of critiquing Obama's deployment of offensive weapons in the military command and closed system? China, China's retaliation, Russia's retaliation, um, and are nuclear missiles in a network era illogical? Um, a substantive question. <laughs> well, the first was an activity question, and as best I can tell, we are doing nothing in that area. But when I say we, of course, we rarely act institutionally as a center. We have an umbrella under which people can be doing things. I don't know. Uh, this sounds more like a Belfer kind of question. It's our Belfer Center over at the Kennedy School for Science and International Affairs that tends to, has Graham Allison and uh, Ashton uh, Carter. <laughs> I wanted to auto-complete that with a different name, but then I didn't. Um, Ashton Carter, uh, uh, they uh, are often thinking about nuclear uh, issues and nuclear security. The closest I can say individually is, I did just write a piece 
for some publication, I'm forgetting its name now. Uh, Scientific American, that's it. <laughs> An oldie bit of goodie. <laughs> Ouch, <laughs> they're the CompuServe of modern publishing. <laughs> Sorry guys, thank you for publishing my article. Um, <laughs> I wrote an article for Scientific American uh, asking in a sort of uh, trolley kind of way, which I later regretted, we have kill switches in iPhones, so if they are stolen, somebody can have it shut off. Why don't we have kill switches in military weaponry so that if it gets stolen, as ISIS came upon three divisions worth of sophisticated US military hardware when it captured the Iraqi city of Mosul and then promptly put it on parade. And then um, you can see one of them turning donuts in this Vice video. Uh, Sam Gustin, are you here? Sam, are you, no? Oh, he was here yesterday. One of our new fellows works at, at Vice Media. Um, uh, they embedded with ISIS and caught them turning donuts in American tanks uh, in Syria and uh, then deployed it against the Mosul Dam. And the question is, why shouldn't those tanks have been turn offable like a stolen iPhone? Um, oddly enough, tanks do not even have ignition keys. If you can get yourself inside the tank, it's just like one button startup, which first, I guess if you're not in the military, your first reaction is, well, that seems weird. And then your second reaction is, well, who wants to be like, do you have the keys? No, do you have the keys? <laughs> Damn it, I left it under the turret. Where are the keys? So it makes sense that they wouldn't have keys. Um, now, of course, the first thing you're probably thinking is, well, what if it gets hacked? Like, you know, haven't you seen Battlestar Galactica? Spoiler alert, the Cylons hack the ships. Um, so uh, not one to um, countermand the wise advice of Commander then Adama. Um, uh, you could come up with all sorts of ways to deal with that. For instance, maybe the tank should expire after a while. <laughs> like, it'll keep working until it doesn't, and then it needs a renewal code that you can either punch in or it can be sent by satellite. Yeah, we can work on this. Like, we have a can-do-ism about so much, and then a lot of people are like, nope, there is no way to make a tank not be in the hands of ISIS and do terrible things. I'm really sorry. So, um, as you can tell, I've been thinking a lot about that thing in particular and borrowing a little bit from the permissive action link framework of nuclear weapons so that even if the two guys in the silo uh, want to launch it on a lazy Wednesday, they can't without the codes from the nuclear football. We've been thinking about action at a distance uh, in this mode uh, before. Other uh, questions? Yes. Hi, uh, do I introduce myself? Yes. Uh, Yuni Hong. Yes, hello Yuni. Really important writer. And uh, you just came out with a book called The Birth of Korean Cool. That's right. Thank for which you. uh, you're just about to get a plug for it on, uh, on the big screen. Yay. <laughs> it's a great cover. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you're like, that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> Certain forms must be observed. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. No, my question actually was, uh, do you think in the foreseeable future there are going to be ways to deal with cross-border privacy problems with, um, you know, for example, the Apple Fitbit or whatever? Is, you know, in, in the UK, as you know, uh, the health data is completely yes. private. Yes. Right. So that would be something that would be problematic, right? Yeah, which is a nice subset of the question of... Right. If law isn't global, but technology is, how can the technology adapt or reconcile with that? Can it be zoned so it behaves differently in one place or another? And I don't know if any uh, one, especially among our European cohort, has any thoughts on this question. Urs, don't you teach a class on this subject? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why well, that made him mad. <laughs> it's like... Well, but the, the class only adds to the confusion, so uh, the, the, <laughs> there is honestly not, a, not an easy answer to that. But yes, it's very much, of course, the topic that we're interested in, um, which also allows me to add a dimension to our work, which is that we do a lot of international work, exactly looking into issues such as privacy, but also speaking of platforms, intermediate liability as another example. 
uh, we and how it's treated differently exactly in different, in different countries and what the problems are and how we can approach these differences so the network of centers would be the uh, search term here um, which brings together over 30 centers internet and society centers around the world uh, including 10 from the global south um, where we explore some of these cross jurisdictional questions among many others and this has been one of these like we're slowly building the house out of bricks getting each internet research center in different countries on board uh, and actually gathered a number of them together over the summer in the Radcliffe yard to be able to contribute to a great understanding either immediately on an issue that suddenly unfolds or over time looking at some of this stuff from a comparative perspective. And of course, one way is to look at how the different laws may or may not apply. Uh, the other is to see ways in which the technology itself will be zoned so that location might be nearly everything. And when you land in a certain place, what you see in Google, how your Apple Watch behaves, will be different than if you had stayed home. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, of course, depends on your priors. For those who thought of the internet as sort of a First Amendment imperialist tool, weird to see those juxtaposed, I know. Um, uh, this kind of zoning may not be great. I don't know if the fact that you can, if you're in Thailand and you go to one of those great videos making fun of the Thai king, it's blocked for you in Thailand, but not everywhere else in the world. Is that a happy medium or not? I don't know. Yes, sir. <clears throat> there are some minor league uh, zoning uh, operations already in, in force, in, say, on DVDs. You can only play them in zone one or zone two, or you can only play them five times in zone two and then it'll shut off, or, or you can only download this music or that film yes. in the country of origin, or you can't do it here in any case. Yes. Uh, so there are already some zoning operations. Exactly. And I had that actually wonderful experience, uh, kind of Berkman Center moment, where I was talking to uh, one of the lawyers that we work with a lot, who's taught a class here on a number of occasions, and talking about this regional DVD zoning and of course, what do you do with a PC when it's like, it doesn't know where it is? And I don't know if you've ever had this happen. Your Mac is like, all right, I'll change your region this time, user. But you only get four more changes. It's like, but what if I'm peripatetic? And it doesn't talk back. It, it's not that version. But um, uh, I was mentioning this once to this lawyer. He was like, yeah, I invented that. It's like, you. <laughs> you invented regional DVD zoning. He's like, summer's different in Australia. Like, they want to window the movies. And of course, whether or not the industry is going to a place where it's still thinking in those terms, uh, or whether we're feeling like there's just this instant gestalt is one of the questions. But you're right, regional DVD zoning is just one of those uh, examples. Peter, was there something you were going to nope. jump in with? No? Other questions, thoughts, comments? Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Flaviano from Brazil. Uh, Welcome. Is there, thank you. Is there any uh, research project concerning uh, sensitive, sensitive personal digital information and democracy? I mean, the relation between uh, privacy and democracy. Uh, does Berkman Center have any research pro project concerning this interrelation between uh, sensitive personal information and democracy? Give me a verb. Okay. Uh, well, what in Brazil, we, uh, our concept of sensitive information, yes. personal information, is that uh, is the one that the kind of information that, that can cause discrimination. For example, my health information, uh, health information. If I, if I have a, a health problem, and if an employer knows about it, it might discriminate against me yes. and not give me give me a job. Yeah? Yes. And in Brazil, we're totally concerned about that. Yes. Nowadays, because uh, uh, that's. Pretty, it, 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 uh, it really has to do with democracy. Because yes. In our concept, democracy has to do with uh, distribution of power. And if the government and, and big corporations yes. uh, get, uh, get ac access to this kind of information, you know, yes. uh, that's not democracy. They're going to have more power. Yes. Yeah? So, I if, sorry if I. No, no, okay. quite all right. Thank you. Um, sure. Uh, we think about privacy, of course, as we were talking about. We think about democracy in the sense that we think about public discourse a lot, too. And public discourse is often seen not just as an end unto itself, which it surely is, but in a Sunsteinian sense as a means to effective democracy and being able to engage in public discourse without worrying that 
the price of doing so is a level of trolling, bullying, release of data, whether to the government that might disagree with you or to the public at large wanting to dox you uh, is surely something some of our projects have taken up, uh, including literally one on bullying, I believe, which we'll see if Shailen can find or Urs can whisper some search terms uh, over to Shailen on that. Um, but you also raised the question of how do we figure out what questions to focus on and at what's the right level of generality? And that is a constant semiotic battle. Um, we don't feel like it's that fixed. And what we trust is in bringing into the community people who come with their own questions through a form of dialogic education, fellows hours, other events, uh, and gatherings have a chance to hone them to say, oh, well, maybe the question I meant to ask was more this rather than that and then to make progress and publish the results and, and see what uh, we can do. It's been really interesting over the summer to see among the Berkman cohort a lot of talk about uh, the tyranny of the algorithm emerge, whether it's the right to be forgotten, which is really, in some ways, the right of the European governments or the private litigants that they're empowering to determine what this Google search engine will do, despite what it would naturally, naturally otherwise do. Um, and then when you look at Facebook and my Ferguson question, or I had written a piece on could Facebook determine the outcome of an election by salting news feeds with, um, selectively with where your polling place is kind of thing. Um, and I, it was great to see out of that come questions around this algorithmic stuff, which none of us had quite focused on uh, at first as the issue. So it'd be interesting to see the way in which your question would be processed relating the privacy and the democracy uh, components together. So, yep. Uh, <clears throat> Nick Grossman from Union Square Ventures. Uh, one of the most interesting and confounding developments in tech and law recently has been blockchains and Bitcoin. And yes. uh, back to your original question of like, is it illegal? I don't know, you know, when the internet just started. Yes. I feel like that's happening now yes. in that whole space. Uh, that's, it seemed conspicuously absent from the things you've highlighted. Uh, is there anything going on with that? Yeah, as, again, uh, Bitcoin, blockchain stuff, it has certainly all the hallmarks of like, wow. Um, we have definitely covered it. I actually covered Bitcoin in a reading group in 2011, and we just stupidly didn't pool our lunch money and like buy two to create a new endowment for anything at Harvard. It was our mistake not to realize that the public would be as weird enough as to, what's the wonderful tweet? Uh, somebody said, my grandmother asked me, um, what's Dogecoin? Answer, it's a cryptocurrency based on the meme of a Shiba Inu. Grandma, I don't understand a single word of what you just said. <laughs> it's a great piece called like things are getting really weird. Um, so there are folks here. I don't know if Primavera is here. Uh, ah, I, uh, so Primavera is thinking a lot about Bitcoin with a number of other uh, fellows. I don't know if there's something you quickly want to say about that. Um, well, not really, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do think it's a really important issue. We organized uh, last year uh, a discotheque on Bitcoin. Um, you should say what a discotheque is, otherwise people are going to think we're so just So discotheque dancing. is uh, not about dancing, but it's about discovering technology. Yeah. And dancing at the end <laughs> to celebrate. Uh, so we did organize uh, on mesh networking and on uh, Bitcoin. And I do actually hope that uh, this year we're going to organize a yes. lot of things on and Bitcoin and Ethereum and uh, all those smart contract things, which I think in terms of uh, legal issues actually raising really interesting legal issues. Yes. And I should say Bitcoin is an example of something that bursts into the public eye, may have been brewing for quite a while, has a lot of technical detail to it for which many people, including experts, will weigh in on it without actually understanding the tech. And a lot of our first move as a center is just to get the tech in order, to have like a teach-in about that, to know what Bitcoin is. And is it a Bitcoin or the Bitcoin? I kind of like remember the Wikipedia. Um, so really getting to the bottom of that and then starting to map out, well, if this turns out to be true about it, then these are the implications in a way that, again, has that kind of honest broker feel to it. There's a lot of stuff going on at the center that surely hasn't been talked about today. This is one of them with folks thinking about not just Bitcoin again, but about um, the so-called ledger. Oh, there's Dogecoin. How nice. Um, 
and then it's D is for Dogecoin. Um, and there's also Coinye West. The, um, so like, why doesn't everybody have a cryptocurrency? You now can too. And uh, the form of public journaling is, oh well, too bad. Yeah, the billboard thing was, yeah, oh well. We really should have given everybody a Coinye West as a door prize. Maybe that's the prize for the pub trivia quiz. Oh, Kurt already left. <laughs> He's going to call his broker right now. So um, all sorts of topics like that, that we try not to just make the topic of the week, but really dig in. Kate Darling sitting right in front of you, thinking a lot about robot ethics and uh, many issues on that. Lots of ways in which we're kind of in for the long haul on. And I should also say it's to our credit as a center that when everybody else was worried about Y2K in 1999, Boston University had a center for millennial studies. Like what they're doing now, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Only 990 years until the next millennium. Where will you celebrate? Um, and a lot of people were pushing us to be like, Y2K, like, oh, liability, what are we going to do? And we were like, you know, call us in 2001. Um, I don't know if that was right. I'm looking at Andy now. Like, maybe it was a problem back then, but 2005. Uh, oh, look at that, the Center for Millennial Studies. It's a great logo. <laughs> <laughs> From the rooster to the owl. <laughs> Talk about the trademark search. It was like, I guarantee no one else has this mark. So anyway, uh, we're at 1.30. Can I just say, holy crap. All right, well, on this totally absurdist Dada-esque note, let me just once again, on behalf of Urs and all of the great staff uh, here at the Berkman Center, just give you the warmest of welcomes, say we really hope you'll find some time to uh, take part of the other, uh, uh, um, I was going to say initialization activities. That sounds rather <laughs> Borg-like. Um, uh, but uh, really to be involved and uh, to reach out to any of the folks you've heard from today or that you'll find on the website uh, or in the activities. We live in a really interesting time, and as Urs said, this is one of the best vantage points, not just to see it unfold, but to be thinking about it and to be making a difference where we believe we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kaylin.